evening, America. Welcome to the Leslie Marshall Show. I'm your host tonight, Mark Levine. Proudly guest hosting for Leslie when she is out of town. She chooses me first, and I am really honored to have that privilege. I know how much Leslie appreciates her radio audience, and I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you tonight. I think you'll be glad you tuned in tonight's show. You may not be happy you tuned in, but I think you'll be glad. In fact, uh, in terms of you not being happy, I think you'll actually be horrified. You may even be haunted by some of the tales you're about to hear, the stories that people witnessed, the lives that they have led. And yet, even though tonight's show and tomorrow night's show, which is on the same topic, may well make you angry, may well upset you, may make you sad, I hope it will drive you to action. What we're talking tonight about is child abuse but not the standard kind of child abuse that you're thinking of when I use those two words together. You're probably thinking of parents that abuse their children. Well, parents abuse their children, perhaps, but indirectly in the cases that I'm about to cite to you, because parents will send their children, their troubled children, maybe they have a drug problem, maybe they have a behavioral disorder, to camps, treatment camps, treatment facilities, in-house facilities, to cure them, to make them better. Drug treatment programs, perhaps, to get them off drugs or something to modify their behavioral disorders. Some of these programs, I'm sure, are quite beneficial, help the teens, uh, the children, make them get better. Uh, I, I'm sure that's true, though I would like to hear from people if you've been through a successful program. What I want to focus on tonight, though, is the unsuccessful programs, the abusive programs. Because what you're going to hear tonight is tales that will, well, stand your hair on end. Stories of torture, of people beating up children, holding them to the ground, sometimes one child on each limb, and literally beating the uh, whatever out of them. Stories of kids being held in isolation, being treated worse than prisoners in a prison. All for crimes they didn't commit. Some of these kids weren't even on drugs. In other cases, the child might have a drug problem, but had no idea they were going to a prison camp, or worse. I first encountered these, I don't want to say stories, because they're all um, what these people live through. I first encountered the uh, things that I heard about, about the people, the children, the teens who had been abused and now adults recounting what happened to them in their lives back in 2005. In fact, uh, I think I was the first radio host to mention this on the air. If you know of an earlier one, let me know. But I was focusing on a program called Straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, Straight Inc., I don't know if straight has an acronym or whatever it was for, but at the time, back in 2005, when George Bush was president of the United States, frankly, I was focusing on a Bush crony. He was our ambassador to Australia and Italy. His name is Mel Sembler. And I was focusing on the fact that Mel Sembler, having given a 100000 plus to the Bush campaign, was awarded with an ambassadorship. Of course, he didn't speak Italian as the ambassador to Italy, but that's not unusual, right? I mean, that happens all the time. Presidents appoint the cronies who raise money for them to be ambassadors. That, unfortunately, is all too common. What was uncommon about Mel Sembler, though, was that he was the CEO of this uh, teenage uh, facilities called Straight, which was supposed to help teenagers get off drugs. And then I heard the stories of people calling in, stories of horrific abuse, stories of beatings, stories of uh, no staff being there and the children being in control, much like that famous book by William Golding, Lord of the Flies, stories of, of harrowing escapes where people jumped off the roofs to try to escape, stories of people being locked in a closet, forced to... Um, Sorry to be graphic, but forced to defecate in their shorts because they weren't allowed out. Really horrific stories. And soon th the show, back in 2005, became a lot more, about a lot more than a Bush crony. It became about the abuse of children. The all-too-common abuse of children in these so-called treatment centers. These 
private centers, although sometimes funded by the government, often religious centers, in fact, often identify with some religious faith, although I would really hope that no religious faith actually knows what's going on in these places, where people are horribly abused. Anyway, I found out back in 2005 about these things. Uh, the tales, the stories, the witness accounts were so horrific that I did two more hours show on that back in 05. In fact, you can find the link to those old shows on today's show uh, at marklivingradio.com or marklivingtv And I thought, well, it was a horror, but it was basically over. Straight was investigated by the Senate. It was shut down due to these abuses. Uh, Strait was closed down in 1993. The Bush crony, that was my focus. You know, he still became ambassador, and I thought that was troubling. But, you know, Bush is no longer in office, and I thought these problems were basically resolved. Fortunately, I was wrong. I want to thank Marcus Chatfield, who uh, contacted me. He had heard my old shows in 2005 and wanted to let me know that these things still continue today. That, in fact, uh, these programs, similar to Straight, under a variety of names, still continue today. And then I let the notice out. I was going to do another show on this, and people contacted me in droves. I got dozens and dozens of emails from a lot of different people telling me their horrific stories, and the stories are horrific. And I've invited them to call into the show today by dialing 888-653-7543. I want to read to you just one story, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. This is the story of Alexei. I think it's actually a fairly typical story. In this case, Alexei had Tourette's. You know what Tourette's is. It's when you can't control what you speak. A lot of times people with Tourette's say, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, swear words. They can't help themselves. Any doctor, any one therapist with the basic knowledge of Tourette's knows they can't help themselves. But this person was placed in heritage school at the age of 14 because of uh, his Tourette's. I think this is a, a male. I apologize if it's a female. And um, I'll say his. If, if I'm wrong, Alexei, you can call and let me know if I've got your I'm sorry. I, I'm not clear of your sex here. In any case, um, I think it's a girl, actually. Let's say it's a girl. Excuse me. Anyway, so Alexei is put in heritage. And like most Tourette's cases, she can't help but say the swear words, she's put at level one, which is the lowest level, which means that she has to be in isolation. In isolation for months and years on end. Put in isolation. Now, if you talk to, to prison officials, they will tell you that's the most cruel thing you can do to a prisoner, to put them in isolation. They were put in isolation. Uh, she writes she was never violent, but she heard the screams of others. And um, she was put there and found out that the only way out was lying and sneaking. They had a very tough program, she writes, and she learned that only by lying and sneaking could she get out of it. And um, the only way she got to a higher level was by pretending she had converted to Mormonism. Since all the staff was uh, part of the Mormon religion, uh, they, that got her high up and getting all the privileges until uh, one day... Um, uh, again, I apologize that this was sent to me, so I'm going to just read the account. Uh, this Alexi was caught masturbating, and uh, that put this person right back into isolation and um, right back at level one. When Alexi came home to a surprise celebration years later after being so mistreated, um, there was a banner that read, Welcome Home. And she sat in silence as people tried to talk to her. After an hour, my mom, she writes, told everyone to leave. It just wasn't happening. The first few weeks I spent curled up in the corner. This is just one example. I've got examples of people telling me that people committed suicide. I got, I got letters from parents who tell me that their child is in something now. I got letters from lawyers who told me that people have been asked to sign their children away to actually make these programs the guardians of their children so the parents actually lose their parental rights, lose their child to these torture facilities. It's disgusting. But I don't want to spend any more time telling you about it because they're not my stories. 
They're the stories of the people who live through them. And already, the lines are full. Already, Marcus, Tony, Lee, Angelique, and Jackie are all calling in from Ohio, from Canada, from Florida, from North Carolina, to share what happened to them. This is widespread. It may be the greatest abuse story that you've never heard. But you're going to hear it tonight, and you're going to hear it for three hours tomorrow. Let me go first of all to Marcus, because Marcus, uh, you've done a tremendous job, frankly, in bringing your community together to talk about what happened to all of you. Thank you so much for contacting me originally, for convincing me this was still an ongoing problem. Well, thank you for doing the show, Mark. Well, I'll tell you, I'd say it's my pleasure, except that it's actually very painful, but it's, it's something that we all need to do. And, yeah. and uh, tell me, you were in straight originally, is that right? Yeah, I was. I was in Strait, 1985 to 1987. And what were some of the abuses that you saw in Strait? Um, it was brainwashing through torture. So if you can imagine all but five hours a day, you are prompted to confess. You're always hungry. You're always thirsty. They don't feed you. They don't let you drink. Uh, no, you got fed just enough to stay alive. Um, on Sundays, you got a big meal. That was the big, that was the big privilege. But you're chronically hungry. Um, you're, what? you're, you know, you're, you're broken down. You're forced into a disassociated state through verbal abuse, the violence around you, the threat, the constant threat of violence. Um, Edgar Sheen calls that process the unfreezing. Tell me some of the violence that you saw, Marcus. Or, or experienced. Um, well, for example, one of the rules is to uh, pay attention in group and watch the person speaking. It was 12 hours a day of confessions and confrontation. You were required to watch the person speaking. If you, tur if you turned your head away from the person speaking, someone would hold your head aimed so that you would be paying attention. If you closed your eyes, they would open your eyes. If you resisted, they would throw you on the floor and hold you there for hours until, you know... They you can stop trust you resisting. to get up and follow the rules at that point. It, it sounds like a cult, or a particularly bad cult. Yeah. For the, for the parents, it was a cult. The parents um, were told that if you know they didn't put their kids in there, they were going to die from drug use or turn into prostitutes. Or for the parents, it was a cult. It was a cult. For the kids, it was a it was like a prison cult. Um. And, and the parents, let me ask you this, cult, Marcus, I, I, how often did you see your parents while you were in straight? Well, to see your parents, you had to work the program for several weeks and convince the group that you were earnest and that you believed that you were, that you needed to be there and that you were willing to internalize the program. At that point, you could talk to your parents for six minutes. Six During minutes? During that six minutes, you had the option of confessing a past incident to them. That was all you could talk about. So there all you could no tell your parents is what you did wrong, basically. What's that? All you could tell your parents is what straight told you you did wrong. Exactly. Now, what if you tried to tell your parents, hey, they're torturing me, what would happen then? Um, well, first of all, they would tell your parents, they, they, they prepare the parents for that. And if a kid says something like that, they're trained that that is a lie that druggies will tell you, um, and don't believe it. And did you, and did your if parents? if you did that, yeah. you would be put on consequences, which means you'd be allowed three hours a night of sleep, which, you know, every, you'd be allowed to sleep for 15 minutes on the hour through the night. Yikes. Um, you know, I mean... Ugh. That is that is torture. Hey, Marcus, I know this is this is uh, yeah. very emotional for you. I need you to hang on. Unfortunately, we've got to take a commercial on radio. Uh, stick on with me. I want you to tell more of your story. Uh, folks, uh, I'd give the number, but the lines are full. I will give the number out again when the lines get more empty. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. There's so many people that want to talk about this. I, I swear, I don't know why this hasn't been on other radio shows. I guess I do know, actually. One of my listeners wrote in, said that this hasn't been on other radio shows, that, that this is a person who survived this uh, uh, torture, this abuse. 
and wrote in and told me that uh, he had approached another radio show, but they told him, nope, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because Mel Sembler is still a very prominent Republican. Well, you know, I guess that's the problem with right-wing talk radio. This is not right-wing talk radio, but this is also not a political issue. This isn't conservative or progressive. This isn't liberal or conservative. I'm sure there's all kinds of political opinions. This is about children being abused by institutions that actually convince their parents to participate in the abuse. And, and I'm not, you know, I don't even know if I should, I can partly blame the parents. But the parents, you know, as Marcus said, Marcus Chadfield, by the way, who's done an amazing job. An amazing job, not just because he's on the phone right now, but because he really, he gets all the credit for putting the show together. I just uh, put some other things, you know, called a few people. Marcus is part of this group, the Survivors of Straight. And they're a group, they are a really strong group of people who've come together, who've shared this awful experience, most, much like people who, who survive a wartime experience or, uh, God forbid, like survivors of the Holocaust. People who undergo this horrible experience and they bond together and share their stories with each other. And now I have the privilege, you have the privilege of hearing them share their stories with you because once we get past the past, once we get past what happened at Straight, which, thank God, has been closed down, we're going to move on to the programs that are still open today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is still going on. My fellow Americans, this is still going on. And, in fact, there's a bill by Congressman Miller, H.R. 911, to finally regulate these cults, these camps. these They're not treatment centers. They're abusive centers. And I'm not saying they're all like this. But there are enough of them like this that we do need to take action. Uh, so, Marcus, uh, I, I'm going to have to go quickly to a commercial again. But I just want you to say, but before, before we go to another commercial, tell me about how st- the people who survived straight have come together after this experience to form a community. Um, I think it's mostly it's you could attribute it to the internet. Um, there are these online forums where people can post anonymously if they want to, and talk about what it's been like to recover from being brainwashed. Hold it right there. I'm sorry. This is Nature Radio. We have a lot of breaks, but I got to tell you, these things didn't exist. Facebook didn't exist in 2005 when I did this story. And now you've all come together, and I'm proud to be your representative. We will be back in just a few minutes. Hang on to your seats. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. I got to tell you, every time I hear this story, and, and I, I focused on this back in 2005. I don't know why, I, I, and I apologize to all the many people who still are in these programs or just escaped from these programs. I kind of thought it was over. Straight was shut down. I was focusing on a Bush crony. And uh, again, I want to thank Marcus Chatfield for bringing this back to my attention, that these problems still exist. Uh, Marcus, I'll, I'll let you go just because i got so many people on the line. I've got Tony and Lee and Angelique and Jackie and Kelly, and I want to get to all of you. All of you. Already is happening what I feared was going to happen on this show, and that is that there are so many people with so many tales of abuse. And each of you, I want to give time. I want you to share your story. I want to hear from you. And yet I know there's so many others that can't call in because the line is full. So please forgive me. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I'm probably just going to quickly try to move on to the next caller simply because I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to be heard. So I apologize. I know there's a lot to be said. That's why I'm doing the show tomorrow as well from 7 to 10 p.m. so I can get as many people to testify as possible. Let's go right to Tony in Cincinnati, Ohio. Tony, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Tell me about your story. What happened to you? Well, uh um I agree with everything that Marcus said first. I want to. I don't want to, you know, retell a story. It, it was horrible. It was torture. I want to emphasize that, you know, brainwashing is very real and it's very difficult to understand. And and that that was the worst torture for me was was being psychologically altered and broken. Now you were in straight as well. Is that right? Yes. The, the program I was in was called Kids Helping Kids. So it it's was a different program. Named Yes, it was uh, originally named Straight Midwest. And, and how long did that program exist? Uh, I believe from 1981 until it was bought out by another straight program in 1993. Or no, uh, I'm sorry, 
2006. 2006. So it still exists today. Uh, no, uh, we protested this program between 2007 and 2009, and they were subsequently shut down. Okay. Now tell me, uh, what were you sent there because of drug use or or some other problem? Uh, my parents were told that because I was acting out, I must be on drugs. Uh, really? I was not on drugs. So you weren't on drugs at all, but they, but you were acting up a bit, as kids do. Yes, and I was acting up quite a bit. I mean, I was. We, our family dynamic was terrible, and uh, had an abusive mother. And uh, you know, they, that was a nice place to tuck away at, uh, a kid that wouldn't follow the rules. So, what? How long were you in this facility? Kids helping kids. God, the name is Orwellian. How long were you there? I was there for approximately twenty-one months. And just give me some example of, of what it was like. Well, um, it, the first day was probably the biggest shock I've ever had in my life. I, I didn't know a place like this could exist. Um, everyone was wearing sweaters and had their hair cut all nice, and looked, they looked very nice, like church, you know, like when you went to church, but, but they didn't look like they were there, and their eyes were blank. And um, sounds just like once I was uh, once I was taken in the back, uh, they quickly became violent, and I knew by the questions they were asking that I was in big trouble. And uh, well, now, when they took you, sorry. It's, you say they became violent. I'm I'm sorry to ask you to be specific, but people don't know what you've been through. Uh, did they hit you? Mm -hmm. They slapped you? They what did they What did they do? No. Well, first of all, I was 14, and I was small for my age, so I, I was like a little kid. Sure. And these were larger males. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I decided that I didn't think I wanted to be there. You know, maybe I wanted to go use the restroom or something, and I was um, tackled and restrained and put in um, a restraint position on the floor. Um, and I accidentally kicked a hole in the wall trying to not be restrained, and they said that that was due to my druggy behavior. Um, but I mean, I, I wouldn't even be calling in today if, if these programs didn't still exist. I would, you know, the, the, I could leave the past in the past. But there's hundreds of these programs. Tell me more. Themselves. I know. Tell me more what you saw over 21 months. So tell me some of the worst things you saw, either to you or to other other kids in the facilities. Well, um, I saw one. You know, we called each other foster brothers when we were in there. Um, I saw one. Uh, foster brother, um, he, act, he snuck a razor blade out of a, a, a razor, uh, one of those plastic disposable razors, and cut another foster brother's throat to try to escape. Oh, my God. Um, now he, I just talked to him a couple years ago. I believe he's on serious drugs. Yeah. Um, oh. And he didn't do drugs before the program either. Uh, and, and the person that he cut his throat was all right, but he died about a year after he got out of the program. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of, of damage caused by this program. Um, and, Tony, in, in your life after uh, you've been out of this program now, I guess um, uh, you can tell me, I, I, I didn't do the math, 10 years, something like that? Over, over 20. 20 years. How does it affect about you 20 today? years. How does it affect you today? Well, it's, it's always affected me in some ways. Uh, since I got out, I've had anxiety problems and insomnia. I just just yesterday got a diagnosis of three sleep disorders um, from a sleep clinic, and uh, I've had to live that with that my whole life. It's very difficult to navigate through life with that. Tony, I want to thank you for calling in. There's so much more I know you could tell me. I just got a bunch of people I need to hear from. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, okay, let's go you. to Lee in Toronto, Ontario. Lee, welcome to the show. Lee, are you there? Is this Lee or is this somebody else? Okay, Lee, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Lee. Uh, you're in Canada. Um, yes. Tell me some of the things that happened to you. Um, I was a survivor of Provo Canyon School from 2002 from 2004. And they this is in Provo, the, Utah. Uh, mental health treatment facility um, for youth that also treats drug addiction and many other issues. Um, but when I was at Provo Canyon School, they were pretty much counterproductive 
to my mental health. There were times when they would lock me in like a bare concrete room uh, with no heat by myself for hours on end, and they would deny um, bathroom privileges uh, for simple reasons such as crying because they said crying was an out-of-control behavior because you weren't in control of your emotions. Wow. Now, this, of course, is in Provo, Utah. It gets pretty cold there to be locked in a concrete room without heat. Yeah, there's, they would just, and also um, a lot of times when they would put you into the timeout room, they would forcibly inject you with Haldol. So, I don't know what that the, is. Uh, it's a drug of some kind. What does it do? Um, it pretty much knocks you out for uh, a couple of hours, and it will affect you for many days after. And you actually are suing the facility that abused you. Um, right now, there I am. There is a lawsuit. Um, they're trying. Provo Canyon School is trying to throw the lawsuit out right now. Um, so that's as far as that is. It, it, um, it, with the lawsuit. Is the facility still open? Yes, Provo Canyon School is still open. And, in fact, Provo Canyon School has had um, civil suits filed on them before uh, by other students for is, is, is this in, this uh, in Provo, Utah? negligence, false is that... imprisonment, and uh, many other different reasons. Let me ask and you, they're is still it... able to be open and torture children today. This is, this is in Provo, Utah, correct? Yes, this is in Provo, Utah. In fact, the, um, Provo is Canyon actually has three campuses. They have one in Provo, Utah for the boys. Uh -huh. uh, the one in Orem, Utah is for the girls, and they have one now in Springville, and apparently that campus um, accepts children as young as eight years old. And is it a private organization? Is it affiliated with the church? Um, no, Provo Canyon is owned by Universal Health Services, and Universal Health Services is the largest provider um, in the United States of residential facilities, and wow. many different Universal Health Service programs have had allegations of abuse. Wow. Hey, Lee, thank you for sharing your story. I'd have longer with you, but again, I got so many people who want to share their stories. Thank you so much for calling thank in. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to get back. Uh, with uh, many more people. It's 888-653-7543. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. It's a follow-up story on a show I did six years ago, and I apologize that I frankly haven't followed it more closely. I will be continuing to follow this story in the future. It's about child abuse. Not that done, at least not directly, by parents, but by parents or courts or institutions or churches sending children to centers that are supposed to heal them that are supposed to treat them, that are supposed to take care of them for drugs, for Tourette's, for some behavioral disorder. And some, I'm sure, do a good job. In fact, I want you to know I've, I've had an exchange of emails with some people who are, are heads of trade industries uh, who do these facilities who assure me that there are a bunch of really good facilities out there. And I hope that they call in and share with me stories about the facilities that work. But what I've heard all too often what I've heard now from hundreds of people is the abusive stories of kids, kids, 14-year-olds, 10-year-olds, young children being beaten, abused, brainwashed, denied food, denied sleep, locked in a room by themselves, told they can't use the bathroom. Basic human dignity, basic human dignity that we give to Al-Qaeda prisoners we don't give to innocent American children who get caught up in a system. I want these people indicted. I want these allegations proven in court, and I want the people that hurt our American children sent to prison. At the very, very least, and this is a minimum, folks, we've got to get Congress to pass H.R. 911, a bill by Congressman George Miller of California, a wonderful man, I used to work with him, that would regulate these things. Because these things are unregulated. 
You can't do to prisoners what was done to these innocent American children that are testifying here tonight and tomorrow. Cindy Drew Etler uh, wrote me when I said I was going to do this story. She is actually the author of a book about straight. Uh, she's uh, written her memoir at www.straightling.com. And in fact, she actually, amazingly, is a life coach for teens. So I guess she's doing right what was done wrong to her. Cindy, welcome to the show. Mark. Hi, Mark. Thanks Hello. Thanks for speaking with me. Tell, tell me about your experiences, um, briefly. Okay. Um, well, I was in the Springfield, Virginia Strait at the same time, actually, as Marcus. This would be mid-1985. I was in there for 16 months. Um, I was very young when I went in. I was 14 years old. I smoked pot for the first time in September. Oh, no. And I went into, yeah, and then I went into straight in November. So, Well, that, that, there's a death penalty for that, I think. Um, yeah. Um, how long were you in, and what did they do to you? I was in there for 16 months, and the things that happened to me personally were more of the psychological bent than the physical bent. There okay. was definitely, def definitely physical stuff going on. You saw it every day, kids getting ripped out of the group and slammed onto the floor, literally slammed onto the floor, that's not hyperbole, mm. um, and held down in a six-point restraint by their peers. Um, I was the shrinking violet. I was the kid who, I was just so scared. I wasn't going to cause trouble. Sure. So I tried and tried and tried to say the right things and have them approve of me and everything I said, they just turned it inside out and turned it against me, and so I just wasn't allowed to progress. Um, something that no one has talked about yet, but the thing that was the most horrifying for me was this thing called review. Every Monday and Friday night, we were kept in the building. We got to the building at 9 in the morning, and we were kept there till about 1 o'clock the next morning, so you can imagine, you know, the exhaustion. Um, but in review, everybody reported their quote-unquote concerns. They narked on everybody else. And it was hmm. cannibalism. Everybody, you know, if, if, if I told on you, that made me look better. And did the you get you, rewards if you told on another kid? The reward you got was the approval from staff or the intimation that you weren't going to be in trouble. But that was never, you know, y you could put in a concern and you got a little pat on the shoulder, and then two hours later you got stood up in review and screamed at. And that was what was the most terrifying to me, yeah, I was a little child, and having my peers in a mass packed around me, literally a half an inch from my face, screaming and spitting in my face, and there was a name for that. It was spit therapy. It was Spit therapy. They, actually, they had a name for it. Yeah, they had a name for it. They had, I mean, we were straightlings. You know, they had a name for everything. Um, so this was something good very, for them. I'm sorry. The spit therapy was something that this was, this was a good thing that they wanted to happen, I guess. They wanted spit therapy. Absolutely. It was, um, oh, God. I Cindy, mean, I, I wish I, there was a way with words I could convey the look on a child's face when they were receiving spit therapy. The, the drop jaw and the big eyes. And the scariest part of it was that there was no reprieve. Nobody was your friend. Everybody, literally everybody was out to get you because that was the only way to make themselves safe. So I think that's a lot of where the brainwashing comes in is that constant sure. fear. Um, you mentioned Holocaust victims and, and war survivors. The difference, I think, between straight and a lot of those other settings where people really are, are tortured or prisoners is your co-prisoners are your allies and in straight you had no ally everybody was didn't out. you have any friends i mean didn't couldn't you at least say to a, a fellow uh, you know girl in, in the in the program hey let's at least stick together and, and that way they won't get to us you know what would happen if you did that she would put up her hand in a sea for concern and you would get stood up and spit on and review and everybody would cheer and everyone would rally around to be the next one to get in your face and scream. But, and, uh, but Cindy, I mean, did, uh, and, and, and please understand, I'm not criticizing you if you did this. I completely no. understand. But did you do that, too, with someone else? I mean, wasn't there anybody you could trust? There was no, well, you know, I stayed in a host home once where the family, um, 
bought milkshakes for us after review Friday night. They got milkshakes and chocolate chip cookies. And it was deemed that I was too comfortable in that home because the parents were kind and I was immediately moved to the host home of the meanest, I won't swear, but the meanest No, wait, 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 wait. How did, so, so wait, so straight found out that you were a foster mm-hmm. child, I take it, shuffled from home to home, right? In straight, yeah, you lived in host homes. You okay. lived in the, the so, homes of kids who had been in the program longer. So straight found so out a- that you'd been given a milkshake and punished mm-hmm. the people who gave you the milkshake and you by moving you. Right. Because and milkshakes are evil, in, I guess. They moved me into the home that was going to be the cruelest to me, and that really, that was the stated mode of treatment, was to um, was to terrify everybody into confession. And Cindy, so that's, it really, I don't really have a lot of time. Is. Tell me this. Oh, You're, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Your parents, um, do you, were they alive? Did they know about this? Did they participate in this? What was their uh, role? Very quickly, I'll say I have a theory that um, straight is used by those parents who are so abusive, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's, it's a way to get themselves off the hook. I'm, ho- wow. I'm horrible to my kid, and I can't face it, so I'm just going to lock them up out wow. of my hands. So now you actually have a teen coach business yourself now? You're trying to... I do. to I mean, that's got to be tough. You're trying to do the nice things, but how to, how, let me ask you this. How can a parent know? And again, you're Cindy Drew Adler. You have the story. You're a fine human being, but, but parents don't know you. How can they find out whether the organ, maybe they do have a kid that's using drugs or or far worse than marijuana, you know, very serious Mm -hmm. drugs, crack or whatever. Uh, And maybe they have a kid who has, has what should a parent do? How do they know who to trust? How do they know whether these these centers are abusive or actually kind people like, you know, the, the, the organization that you have? Right. There's a great website that I absolutely would recommend parents go to. It's called survivingstraight.com. It's basically an encyclopedia of knowledge. It not only has the stories of many, many straight survivors, it also has links to all kinds of great information about evaluating a program, how to decide whether a program is legitimate or not. Um, there's also a book out there called Help at Any Cost, which does a great job of breaking down what's out there and how to evaluate a program. Well, Cindy, you've been terrific. Thank you so much uh, for being on the show. I just got, I got to go on because there's so many people that have called in. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Folks, if you want to call in, it's 888-653-7543. Tell me your story. If the lines are full, we will eventually get to you, whether it's tonight or tomorrow. I will do my best to hear everyone's story. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine discussing treatment centers that are supposed to treat children, supposed to take care of children, teenagers, for drugs or other problems, but end up abusing them. The granddaddy of them all, the one that began all the abuse, the one that I concentrated on back in 2005, was called Straight Inc. and was run by a good Bush crony, good fan of the Bush administration, that raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for George Bush and was rewarded with an ambassadorship to Italy and Australia, a guy by the name of Mel Sembler. Straight Inc. was closed down, but its progeny have propped up everywhere. It is still going on today, and I am taking your calls, and so many of you are calling in that I'm afraid I had to keep some of your calls short because there's so many tales of abuse and so many people have suffered it. 888-653-7543. Jackie in Cardington, Ohio. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Tell me, uh, what uh, program were you in? I was in the Elan program uh, located in Poland Springs, Maine from 1979 to 1982. And is that program still going on today? Um, no, they, were clo- they closed April 1st of this year, uh, stating that it was due to negative Internet campaigns. Just this year they closed? Yes. Okay, tell me. And the woman that owned it, uh, Sharon Terry, yeah. has opened up a Racino um, in Maine. I'm not sure where, but uh, there's a lot of political ties there. Bill Diamond, uh, the senator, uh, was their government liaison. A Maine senator? Yeah. 
And uh, so how do the politicians protect these, these kind of centers? Um, I think it was probably from campaign donations. I can't, I mean, there's been uh, associations of Mitt Romney with uh, WASP. Um, WWASP. Uh, it's what WWASP. Right. I, don't, I don't know what that stands for. Um, right. Um, you know, and I'm I'm looking into some other things myself because I want to do a paper on the politicians that are involved in it because I really think that's a big reason that HR 911 not got didn't get any further than it did is because there were senators and other you know people in the legislation that had their hands greased. I hear Certainly. you. Jackie, tell me what happened to you in Elon. Tell me some, I know that there's not enough time to tell me right. what you suffered for three um, years, but give me some examples of some of the treatment. Well, um, I, I was a problem child. Um, I had been raped when I was young, and I had gone through mm. a lot of physical and emotional abuse. Um, my mom had tried to commit suicide. I ran away from home, came back. Dad said, you're going to Elon. So September of 79, I got there. Um, the first first day I was there, I was given a quell shower. I don't remember it. Um, I'm not sure what they did to me. Um, within a couple weeks, um, I had been given a general meeting, uh, which is where 30 to 90, maybe 100 people are in the audit, in the cafeteria, and um, depending on how many houses they called in, and groups of like 20, 30 people at a time uh, would be in your face, just inches from your face, and you had to stand there completely still, and they would cuss you up one side, down the other, spit on you, um, and you had to just sit there and take it. If you lashed out, you were put in the boxing ring. Um, even if you didn't lash out, you were put in the boxing ring. Wait, I know wait, wait, wait. Put the box times. Well, hold on, boxing ring. What, what, what's that? I know what That's a boxing ring is. A group of other residents and staff will circle around um, one person, and they will call other residents in with boxing gloves, and they will sit there and box. They, they will punch you? Oh, yeah. I had my nose broken there twice. My nose is permanently crooked from my stay there. They would just sit there and punch you in the face? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did you get um, boxing gloves to defend yourself? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. how old are you at this time? I was 13. 13. Now, right. uh, how many people in the boxing ring with you? One at a time. Okay, so presumably they put a bigger kid in there to just punch the heck out of you. Um, with the women, it was just pretty much whoever wanted to go in. With the smaller guys, yeah, they did put bigger guys in with them. Um, I Wait, did, did they put men in there with women to punch no. them, or no, women would punch you, them? They almost did one time with me. Um, one of the last times that I remember being in the ring, I was moved from the Poland Springs complex to Parsons Field in Limerick, Maine, because they were doing a documentary um, in 1981, I believe it was 2020, and was something like Children of the Dark or Children of the Night. Well, while in Parsons Field, it had come out about the sexual abuse, and I was very angry. And I'm not sure what led up to the boxing ring, but I went, I know I went 10 rounds, 8 to 10 rounds, and because it was, there was about five girls, and it was two rounds each. And I remember the director, uh, Jeff, looked at me and said, he just had like this wicked little smile, and he's like, wow, how do you have so much anger in you? And, uh, and, I mean, that was just one thing. And I saw kids that lived in dumpsters, cleaned them out during the day, were chained to them during, you know, because they had run away. They were made to sleep in them at night. Um, Sleeping in dumpsters at night. Right. I didn't, but the, I, I witnessed other kids doing it. They. Um, you mentioned sexual abuse. Was there sexual abuse at the center, or this was the abuse that before? before? I, I was abused before the center. Before the center, but they made you talk about it in, in public. Right. Right. And, I mean, you know... It, it was a lot of attack therapy. Now, now you said they moved you because 2020 was doing a show. Did they move right. you so you wouldn't talk to 2020? Right. I, I got to say what this reminds me of. I, I, I you know, I'm sorry because obviously I, I don't want to compare it to the one of the most unique, horrific crimes uh, of humanity, the Holocaust. But it does remind me of the, the Czech uh, camp of Theresienstadt where they had they brought the red cross in the nazis and then they would uh you know hide the, the murder and the killing and and put on this face for them uh that's amazing they actually moved you out because 2020 was coming in did you did you ever consider like calling 2020 yourself i, I don't know yeah i, I have i had a website for 10 years called time to close the doors of the lawn and there you know there was a lot of things that we got accomplished me and other people and and people from other organizations getting investigations started but nobody can seem to find a copy of that documentary anywhere. Oh, the original one that was done? Right. Wait, 2020 can't find that copy? Um, and you can't get through to anybody to really ask. 
Wow, ABC News, right? Yeah, I'm not sure which network it is. I think it's ABC. Well, I'll I'll, I'll have to. But if there, I get a chance, I'll look really into it. No, 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 no. I was made to stay in the corner for three months one time, and um, you know that's where you live in the corner, you eat in the corner, you sleep in the corner. Wow, um, three months in the yeah. corner. And I would sit there and I would self mutilate, and not enough to like. I mean, you got to remember, I was like 14, 15. Sure. If I found a paper clip or a staple, I would start to cut myself, and they'd just sit there and laugh. And, uh, like, if you refused wow. to do something, they, you know, for me anyway, they withheld uh, meals. Uh, they had other students watching over other students at night, and if a student took off during that time, the other student that was supposed to be watching them um, was in just as much trouble as, as the guy if they caught him. Um, Jackie, I tell know me. that they would go, go to people's houses and take people out of their houses. Jackie, tell me this, because obviously the horrific abuse that you suffered did go on 30 years ago. It's kind of a catch-22 here, because the teens that are suffering are probably too nervous, too scared, too harmed. Some of them have post-traumatic stress syndrome to speak out quickly. People like you can talk about it because it happened 30 years ago. Right. Is there reason to believe that, I mean, you said Elan was just closed down in April of this year. Is there reason to believe that the kinds of things they did to you are continuing today? Well, I'm pretty sure there's a, um, a, a program in Argentina, I believe. It's under IBICUI.com or .org. And that guy was a resident when I was there, and apparently he opened that placement up a year after he left, from what I'm understanding. Um, tell I me about, talked to him personally. Tell me about right here in the United States. Do you, well, I mean, he's ta there's been rumor that he's bringing it back here, but yes, I definitely believe it still goes on here. And uh, I mean, I don't know whether you talk with people who have uh, gotten out of Elon in, in, in the last two, three, four years. Uh, have you have you talked? Yeah, with I've, I've talked to a couple people, but there's not a whole lot of people that come forward. If they come forward, it's like they're really excited and it's really helped them, or it hasn't and it's totally damaged them. There's no middle ground. Let me encourage, uh, by the way, anyone listening to the show right now, and I know it's hard, and by the way, I am more than willing to take anonymous names, pseudonyms, just give me a first name, I'll accept it, I'm not, but if you have recently been, and, and, and again, I'm not trying to take away from any of the suffering you underwent, Jackie, but particularly people who have recently undergone, have family members, have children who've recently undergone the program, or God forbid, are still in one of these programs, I really want to encourage you to call in, 888-653-7543, if the lines are busy, please keep trying. Because I, I want to, because I want to see what's happening today, Jackie. Thank you very much for sharing what happened to you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Kelly from Baltimore, Maryland, is calling in now. Kelly, um, well, I, I don't want to say what uh, what uh, just was posted. You tell me what happened. Your brother wasn't straight, right? Uh, yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi, Kelly. Thanks for calling in. Um, thanks, thanks. Yeah, my brother was uh, in straight Springfield from 1983 till 85 for about two and a half years. And um, I was 13, I think, when he was put in. He was 15. And, you know, at the time, I, you know, we, siblings had to be involved, too. Um, I was there three days a week, um, Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays. It was a very family you know, involved program, but I was pretty clueless. I really had no idea what was going on. Um, he, unfortunately, well, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but he was uh, very resistant, so he didn't really progress in the program. So for the most of the time he was there, he was on first phase, which means we rarely saw him. Um, you know, when he did earn some responsibility we'd get to see him like marcus was talking about for six minutes you know on a friday or a monday mm. um he came home a few times for maybe a month here or a month there but outside of that he was you know not in our home and i did not get to see him um he escaped from straight seven times wow and, yeah and was brought back each time um it's like a prison when he turned 18 uh, i gotta take a deep breath here. that's okay take your time if you want, Kelly, I'll even take a commercial and come back to you. you want, should, I, should I give you that chance? Or um, go for it? I mean, it, it's up to you. I'm, I'm all right. But. You're all right. Okay, go ahead. Go Work through it. Go ahead. All it's right. okay to cry. <laughs> Tell me what happened. When he, when he turned 18, um, he was able to le legally withdraw himself from the program, which he did. And, um, you know, at that point, I think he wanted to come back home, but 
you know, my mom wasn't, they'd pretty much been coached not to let your kid come back if they withdrew from the program. Mm. So my parents wouldn't really have anything to do with them. Um, you know, I know they regret that today, but I'm sure. Um, so he was pretty much alone. Um, and about six months later, you know, he did have a couple friends who he, you know, who he partied with before straight, and they're all doing fine now. And, um, you know, he's, he hung out with them, but they were all going off to college. And um, in June of 86, he checked into a, a hotel in Springfield. And uh, he jumped to his death. He killed himself. And, you know, at the time, I was, again, I was clueless. I just figured, you know, he was having problems or drugs or something like that. And then years went by, and in 2001, I got online, and something just told me to Google Straight Ink, and I did. And, you know, it changed my life. I mean, I had no idea what he went through in there. You know, and all these kids, and um, it was a real tough realization. It was very hard, you know, to come to terms with that. It took me a while to really, you know, it, it put me in a dark place, I'd say, for a while. But, um, you know, then I came to find out it was still going on, and I felt I had to get involved. And, you know, back in 2001, I actually put up a website um, on webdiva.org. I just wrote a story about my brother. I figured I'd put it out there to hopefully wake up some parents, you know, and ended up coming into contact with all these people who were in straight that knew my brother. And, you know, it was very bittersweet because they all had nothing but great things to say about them. And, um, you know, it just, uh, I've kind of been going at it ever since. Um, Kelly, uh, I can't thank you enough for sharing yeah. this story. Um, I'm going to take a break. I want you to stay in line with me, Kelly. Okay. Uh, okay. Just, I just, I just want to say it's people like Kelly who take this awful situation the suicide, you could call it murder, of her brother by straight, uh, who had pe people who've been through these horrible things, and of course uh, you take someone who has a minor drug problem and they end up, well, committing suicide. And Kelly, I just think it's so brave of you to call in to tell your story, and I'm so glad you found other people, and I'm going to do my best to press hard to get HR 911 passed. If you're listening to my voice, I want you to call when we're done with the show. Call tomorrow. Call Capitol Hill. Call your member of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor H.R. 911 by Congressman Miller to regulate these kinds of organizations so they can't abuse children anymore. Stay with me, Kelly. We'll be right back. 888-653-7543. Back after this. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. If you've just joined us, you're in for an amazing further hour and a half. If you've been with us, you know what's been going on. For an hour and a half, we've been hearing stories of people, mostly adults now, but who were abused as children by a group called Straight Inc. And it's all its progeny, and there's a lot of progeny out there. I don't want people to think this is a 20-year-old story. These are centers that are supposed to help youth help teens, help them either get off drugs or get off a troubled past or get off abuse, and yet they tend to be parking lots for parents who themselves are abusive. At least that's the stories I'm hearing. And then the centers even abuse them worse. Kelly, I want to thank you for being so brave, for telling us about the suicide of your brother, and even more than that, for being so brave as to go online. i got to tell you, Kelly invited me to, it's a closed group on Facebook, so I won't even announce it, but uh, I know that if you are a victim of these centers, you can look for it. You can find it. There's a whole community out there that will take you in. People like Kelly and Marcus and a whole bunch of other people, too numerous to name, will take you in, will help you, will help you realize that what you underwent was not your fault. It was the fault of some very bad people, and they're fighting. And, Kelly, you're leading that fight, and I just got to thank you for having the courage to do that. Well, thanks for doing the show, Mark. Um, I did, you know, I want to mention the you know, Marcus Chatfield and I and, and um, Alex Lane and Todd Eckelberger um, actually a few years ago decided to start working on a documentary about straight. And um, we partnered up with uh, 
four FSU graduates, Christopher Rosa, Andrew Pensner, Patrick Nissim, and Katie Schoons, and we're in the process of pretty much finishing this film up. Um, you know, it's 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 a pretty important project. And, Kelly, um, when, when it's you done, know, you let me know, and I will advertise it as, as much as I can because people need to know can, about this story. You can see the trailer. There's a trailer. It's at uh, survivingstraightinkthemovie.com, and, um, you know, there's a ton of links to other places as well that you can see there. I also wouldn't mind uh, reiterating what Cindy said about um, Help at Any Cost. It's a book by Maya Salovitz, who's very involved. Maya's going to be on the air. I've invited Maya to come on the air. I've, she's going to be come on at 9 o'clock. You, you're not going to miss that. Just real quick, Kelly, if you are a person who's been through one of these experiences and you are looking for people to, to share that, where does someone like that go? Survivingstraight.com? Where else? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I guess we have a break and I lost Kelly. Kelly, write in uh, and I will share that information. Just post it on my website. I want to give people a chance to... Uh, well, if they've been through this, a place to go. Uh, we'll be right back. 888-653-7543. Right after this. So this is Mark Levine discussing an industry, the troubled teen industry, you might call it, a bunch of people that make money treating teens. Now, I have no doubt that there are some successful programs out there. I'm not saying there are none. But what I have learned, without doubt, is that hundreds, if not thousands, it may well be thousands, of American and Canadian teenagers and children have been brutally abused by some of these programs. I want you to know I had an email exchange with Cliff Brownstein. He is the executive director let me get let me get his title here. I don't I don't want to misstate it. Uh, he is the executive director of the hold on the National Association of Therapeutic School Schools and Programs. In other words, he is the head of the association of some of these programs, and he wants um, he says that he wants to balance to the show. Uh, he says there were some bad apples, some abuse. But his organization, composed of private residential treatment centers, therapeutic boarding schools, wilderness programs, doesn't accept knowingly these substandard programs. They have stringent admission standards. Uh, so I said to Cliff, come on the show. Tell me about your programs. He said, no, nope. I contacted him too late. He only found out about it this morning. I said, I was doing the show again tomorrow. Come on tomorrow. Bring someone. Nope, nope. He's going to wait till they're ready. I said, I don't know what takes him so long to prepare, honestly. If I were the national executive director of a national organization, I would have all kinds of statistics and support for my cause. But notwithstanding that, I told him that I would do another show when he's ready. So I want to hear about the positive experiences as well. But so far, what I'm getting is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly negative experiences. And I'm sharing them with you. I'm sharing them with you because... Well, if you've been through them, I understand it's a cathartic experience. I want to thank all the people at all the places who've been thanking me. Uh, I've been uh, – there's a closed group, by the way, that uh, the Survivors of Straight Inc. have very kindly invited me to monitor in Facebook called Survivors of Straight Inc. Uh, they allowed me in because I'm doing this show. But if you're a survivor, I want to encourage you to go there. There's some very nice people there. And I think it's good to have this community, this support. Also, you can go to survivingstraightinc.com. You can go to CAFETY, like safety only with a, a C, C-A-F-E-T-Y dot org. You can go to Program Watch on Facebook. If you go to uh, the movie that they're creating about Surviving Straight, there's survivingstraightinc.com. There's message boards. There, there's a whole bunch of information there. There's a whole community out there if you have suffered. If you have suffered, and not just straight, this straight, as I said, is shut down, but from any of these continuing organizations, WWASP has been mentioned. Apparently, there's a Mitt Romney tie. I'd like to find out more about that. Uh, any of these uh, religious programs, whatever it is, if you've been abused, even if, particularly if you're currently being abused, speak out. In fact, you know what? If you're currently being abused and you somehow got access to this program, I want you to call 911. I want you to call 911. Uh, and you tell them that you need the police. They are beating you. And I, I'm serious about this. If someone is beating you, abusing you, torturing you, denying you food, that's a form of torture, denying you sleep, I want you to call 911. I want you to get the police called 
and to come right away. And if they have a problem with it, you send them to me. Because no one has a right to torture you, to physically hit you, to abuse you. No one. All right? I want to be very clear about that. You're not a prisoner. Frankly, you can't even do this to prisoners. If you are undergoing trouble, if you're too afraid to call 911, at least contact all these wonderful people who've been through this themselves and are looking to find an answer, to find healing. And please, please call your member of Congress and ask them to support H.R. 911 to regulate these centers. Joyce Lynn in Miami, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you. Tell me about your circumstances. Yes, um, oh shoot. I'm from Iran. I was in Iran in 77 to, um, to 80. I had come back. Um, I, I just like to say first off, the people that you'd like to, um, to make calls in that are still in programs, they're not going to be able to call. They can't call. They don't let them make calls, do they? No, no, no. They, they cannot get calls. They definitely cannot get visits. So they will not be able to say anything. Well, if they can escape, they could call dial 911 from a pay phone. I know it's hard. It's like a prison camp. I understand that. Yes, it is. Tell me where you were um, and uh, what happened to you. When, when was this? I was in, I was in Elon. I'm sorry. I'm, I was in Elon. I uh -huh. was in Elon 4, Carson Field, a lot facility. Um, there was, uh, I seen some things that, wow, they had this one kid there. I'm not going to say what his name was. He had epilepsy. He also had a plate in his head. Back then, when I was there, they had these things called cowboy ass kickings. They also had the ring. The ring was a nicer version, but uh, what a cowboy ass kicking was. And they would take this kid. He wouldn't even know what was coming. They would see the director coming into the dining room. And all you'd see is him point, 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 point. You'd get like five or six of the biggest eyes. Next thing you know, you'd hear this guy being clinked off the walls and hear him screaming. And he'd get into the dining room, he'd be all bloody. Well, where was this? And it, this it was in Iran. In it Iran was in, in Iran. Yes, Iran. Okay. The country. Yeah, Iran 4. It was in a uh, person to me. Okay. We didn't even have an address for the place. It was a P.O. box. So we were not... Uh, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. I, I want to make sure I understand you. Are you talking about the country of Iran? Or are you talking about somewhere in the United States? Yeah, I'm talking about the program Elon in Maine. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. The program <laughs> is called Elon. That's E R A N. E L A N. Like e you were speaking with Jackie. Oh, I see. I apologize. E L A N in Maine. And when was this? I was in '77. I was 13 when I went there. Okay. And go ahead. You heard people screaming. Tell me what you what you heard. No, you hear the kids screaming. Is this this called the cowboy ass kicking? Right. The violence that goes on in these places and in Elon. Uh, it was horrible. Um, I've gone through the ring, uh, the general meetings, uh, people just rushing you. And, and because of them rushing you, you get thrown back against the wall and then they spit in your face. And you get people punching you and they had a, a shot and they punch you. And Elon, after, I mean, excuse me, Joycelyn, after you got out of Elon, did you did you tell your parents? Did you tell people what happened to you? Did people believe you? I didn't tell anybody because I thought that's how it was supposed to be. Mm. I thought that's you know. When did you finally? When were you finally able to talk about it? Just recently, and I'm 48 years old. See, that's my concern: is that kids today who are suffering now, 17, 20, 20, you know, even mm -hmm. people that 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 they're afraid to speak out, that they're afraid to call in. Yes, they are. Well, thank you for sharing your experience. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for calling thank in. You. Thank you for having me. Let me go to Chris in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Chris apparently is directing a film based on his experiences. Uh, Chris, where were you? Hi, yes. Um, my name is Chris Rose. I'm here with Andrew Pensner, also the director. Thanks for having us, Mark. Sure. You, you were actually in one, you and Andrew were both in, in one of these facilities? Well, we were both on the outside kind of looking in. Uh, we were film students at the time when we started this project, and we were introduced to Kelly and their struggle. And over the last 10 months, we've been exposed to probably the most ridiculous string of interviews and incidents 
experiences that we've ever actually experienced. Uh, we've been sued a lot for this movie because they don't want us to necessarily tell this story. Is this um, the documentary so Surviving Straight Inc.? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, it is. Okay. And um, basically, one thing that we wanted to make clear is that a lot of people, because when we started hearing about these, uh, these stories, we couldn't really grasp our head around the whole concept of straight. What is this program? And basically, to put it in layman's terms, it was Lord of the Flies. That's you what did. I thought. That's actually, I, I got I to I I take a little credit for this. Um, in 2005, when I first did a radio show, I mentioned it was like Lord of the Flies. So, you know, if you're doing this film, I don't know if anyone said it before 2005. That's exactly what I thought of when I first heard about this. Exactly. And, and it was, kids would do the most outrageous things. There, there was very little adult supervision. And a lot of, there's a lot, I mean, of course, we're not going to go too much into this because there's just too much to explain. But... They would do anything to each other. Kids could do anything they wanted. We have stories of children being hogtied, hoisted from the rafters, and beaten like a pinata. I mean, these are, this is an 11-year-old boy. Oh, my God. Kids. And, of course, these kids don't know it's abuse. And, again, one thing that was said earlier about parents, you know, how could these parents do this, or was it the parents who were also abusive? These parents had a program of their own when they were in straight. I mean, they, were, they had to confront each other. They had to yell at each other as well. Really? Um, yeah, they they had their own program, and they this would even go to meetings, and they would they would confront each other. This is so it, Orwellian. It it reminds me of, of of a North Korean you know retraining camp. And and if you weren't in, with the program enough, um, you know they would they would try to kick you out. But most of the time, they try to keep the parents in and try to bring in their family members as well. So if you had a kid in straight, they try to bring your other son or daughter into straight because anybody in your past was considered a druggy, a druggy friend or a druggy sibling. Chris, so help, help me with this. You've interviewed now a number of people, so I consider you an expert here. Tell me, explain to me the psychology. I get the kids. They have no choice. They're being abused. They have no one to talk to. Uh, as uh, Joycelyn just told me, you can't even make a phone call to 911 because you're stuck in. I get the kids. Help me understand the psychology of the parents. They can voluntarily put their kids in straight or get out. They can be in these group things where people are yelling and screaming at them, or they can leave. They have that choice. Why were the parents involved? Explain that to me. The kids couldn't really leave. Most right, no, I get the kids. I understand that. What about the parents? The, pa okay. the parents are basically afraid that their child is going to die, and they have been convinced by the people running the program and other kids who are telling their stories that without the program, their kid is going to be dead, insane, or in jail, and that they need it wholeheartedly and depend uh, completely on the program in order to survive, that without the program, they will literally not be alive anymore. So they scare the parents, basically. And most of the kids who didn't have drug problems, they'd go to the parents and tell them, your kid may, may not be doing drugs, but that he shows the symptoms. Of how, do, how, does straight, how do they find the parents and the kids? Were they court-ordered intervention or just a good ad campaign? How, how did people get involved to begin with? When Nancy Reagan visited straight, and this is, of course, despite all the controversy that was going on, and nothing against Nancy Reagan because I'm sure she did not know. I'm sure she but didn't know. I, I won't make a claim either way, but when she did visit, they, they w made this video called The Pilgrimage of Hope. And it was Nancy Reagan visiting the program, and she heard all these crazy stories about kids would stand up, like 11-year-old kids would stand up and be like, you know, I did pot, uh, PCP, acid, heroin. And these kids, of course, would lie because they would have to be constantly admit that they're a drug addict. And when you're 11 years old and you don't have a problem, and you're in this group being pressured to say that you do have a problem, you make up stories. Sure. So Nancy Reagan heard these stories of these kids having, um, pardon my French, intercourse with animals in some ridiculous cases. Yikes. And, of course, she thought, oh, my God, these kids were in danger of losing our children. And so when she was invited to go see the program, that's pretty much where her Just Say No campaign kind of spanned from, was wow. based on these lies of children um, trying to, you know, tell something so that they had something to confess. Chris, hang on. i got to take a break. That's just the nature of radio. 888-653-7543. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. It's a very, been a very emotional show. It's talking about people who've been abused and anytime you talk about people who've been abused it, it gets emotional uh and right now i have on the line chris in dallas who is actually directing a movie called surviving straight inc 
uh, and uh, he's been interviewing a lot of people. Uh, Chris, when will your movie be out? Uh, we're actually in the process of finishing it and then submitting it out to festivals. So, I mean, we're, we're in the last stages. I guess this is the last week pretty much for us, and then it's going to be a, a done deal. Okay, any way I can help you, I'd love to. Seriously. Thank you so much. And, and one thing we wanted to talk about, you were asking, you know, is, is, does this still happen today? Yes. Um, a part of the reason why we started this process, one of my friends who I, I will protect his identity, he went to a wilderness camp and was branded and beaten by a lot of these kids. Br branded? Um, you don't mean branded brand. like an animal, but burned into his skin, do you? A branded as in with a branding iron, exactly. It was just like an animal. And th this is something that was very shocking to me. And, and one thing that I kind of need to mention to people is Straight Incorporated legally changed its name to the Drug Free America Foundation. It has the same tax identification number. Yikes. Same running it. If you go to the Drug Free America Foundation, it says, you know, Be Betty Sembler says, yeah, it's under her resume that she's one of the ten founding members of Straight Incorporated. And when these survivors came out telling their stories of abuse, kids telling that, you know, they had been raped in these programs or that they had been beaten, or in one case, this one girl, when she was being abused by her father when she was six years old, she had to stand up in front of the entire group of straight, uh, straight kids and their parents and apologize to her father no. for having flirted with him. For, for having flirting. flirted with him at age six? Yes, for flirting with him, she imposed, it was because of her actions that he did that. I just I got chills. Did. That's disgusting. It's the most heinous thing. But even after these stories come to the surface, the people who started the program, Mel and Betty Sembler, who are now helping with drug legislation, they, and I quote, this is a very direct quote, they should get a life. Sembler says, she says she's proud of everything they've done. There's nothing to apologize for. The legalizers are the ones who should be apologizing. Well, I got to tell you, I was after Mel and Betty Sembler, uh, Betty Sembler's Mel's wife, by the way, if you hadn't figured that out, back in 2005. I understand they're now supporting Mitt Romney. And uh, coming up at the top of the hour is going to be Maya Solovitz, who's written an article on those connections. We're going to go after them. And if Mitt Romney won't distance himself from them, well, then he's just going to have to suffer through that throughout the campaign. This story is not over. And, and your friend who was in the wilderness campaign, wh how recently was that? That was about two years ago. And another so, friend of mine uh, who was also in a program in Utah, uh, she interviewed with us as well. Um, the experiences that she saw, kids were given food that they were allergic to and denied sleep and put in isolation rooms for hours and weeks at a time. Another shocking thing about these programs is that, and I won't mention this woman's name either because I, I believe she might be calling in as well, um, this one woman was in one of these programs for 13 years. No way. 13 years she was trapped in this program not without education. Most of these kids, another reminder is that they were just denied education. When she left to go tell her story, um, she went to a lawyer, an amazing lawyer, Phil Elberg, um, and she went up to him and he said, similarly like you were saying, comparing some of the things, you know, of course, not to the n things that happened with the Nazis and things like that, and she had no idea what he was talking about at all because she denied education. Chris, of course, uh, I, I could talk with you all day. Unfortunately, there's, I mean, or fortunately, either one, we've got a lot of people who want to tell, tell what happened to them. I hope you'll contact me off air, though, because I want to help your program in any way I can. Good luck in your documentary. Thank you for telling the story, and thank you very much for calling in. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you, Mark. You have a good one. Thanks. Uh, let's go to Chris in Cincinnati, Ohio. Chris, welcome to the... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm told that the woman in Alabama has been... Uh, Anne in Alabama is, is before Chris in Cincinnati. I apologize, Anne. Please go ahead and tell Hi. me what, what happened to you. Hi, Mark. This is Annie from Alabama. Yes. Um, I am not a survivor. My situation's a little different. I have a young family member who was put into... Teen Challenge International in um, Bonifay, Florida. It's also known as West Florida Boys Ranch. This is a faith-based program that advertises, I mean, they're, they're a military-style boot camp. Mm -hmm. And basically, because I'm not his legal guardian, I cannot get him out. And I'm but, hearing wait. all of the same stories that, you know, basically we're hearing on air tonight about the abuse, um, kids being beaten, starved, brainwashed, overworked, overexercised. And I just want to say that, um, and again, these kids that are in there, they're isolated. They, they, have, they cannot have visitors, I think, for the first four months. And Andy, tell me this. You, no said it's, you, reach out. you said it's your nephew, is that right? It, it, it's a family member, a young family member. He's, he, drugs is not an issue. 
he's under the age of 15, and, um, I, you know, again, I'm not the legal guardian, so yeah. there's really not a lot legally that I can do at this point. I, I don't know. I don't mean it, and if this is too private, you, you don't have to answer, but um, what, what you're saying is you're not this child's parent, right? Exactly. I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a family member. Right, and the child's concerned about him. parent, um, why isn't that child's parent the, the, the child's legal guardian? That's my question. Um, it's kind of a long story. He comes from a very dysfunctional situation, and he was um, both parents lost custody of him I see. due to drug problems on their part. I see. And he was adopted um, by another family member, and that is who um, this person is the legal guardian, I see. and that's who put him in this this facility and kind of signed and away I his just rights. wanted to say that yes this this abuse is going on and I'm trying to do as much research as I can and I have um, actually I have documents from the local sheriff's department in um, that county and people are trying to make reports I mean there I have um, a report where a mother had called the sheriff's office and reported that her son had been thrown out of a building um, by one staff member. Two other staff members shoved a garden hose in his mouth, turned on the water, and then made him eat dirt. Oh my God! Later Annie, that oh. evening or later that day. I'm sorry. I I'm sorry. I want to hear. You, I want to hear the entire story. It's just the nature of radio. We've got to take a break right now. Annie, hang on with me. I'm going to hear your story, and then coming up after that, we're going to have Maya Solovitz, who's written a book on this. All of this when we come back. 888-653-7543. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine trying to get my handle around the horrific abuse going on right here in America. Sure, there's murders and horrific things in Syria and L Libya and Iran, but there's some horrible things going on right here at home to our very own American children. Children, teenagers, being brutally abused by centers that are supposed to treat them. And we're hearing, well, one witness account after another. Annie from Alabama, I apologize for interrupting you. It's the nature of radio. I had to go to that break. But I want you to finish the story you were telling me when I had to interrupt you about what okay, happened and, to that family I member. Wanna, um, I just want to confirm, Mark, that I'm reading this from sheriff's reports from okay. the local sheriff's office um, in Holmes County, Florida, where this facility is. Okay. And so this uh, mother had reported the abuse on what happened to her child there. And the, the day that this occurred, that later that day, this child attempted to, to cut his wrists. And there's numerous reports um, from the Sheriff's Department of kids trying to commit suicide in this facility. There's also a, another report. Um, a mother had, had reported that her child had been in there, and according to the dates, it was less than a week. And she reported that the child was um, over-exercised and mistreated, and he was taken to a hospital in Alabama with kidney and liver failure. Wow. And that's only, you know, after being in there a week. So, you know, it's, it's just so disturbing what and is it, going on. And here, one of the things that, that may help you, and uh, one of the things that I've learned from this, and, and I'm learning too, because obviously I, I'm, I'm learning all the time. People are writing me, and a lot of people have contacted me. There, there is some hope for your family member. Uh, what they're telling me is that uh, these organizations, for example, there's an organization called Restoring Dignity. Uh, that's at RestoringDignity.org. It's an international uh, non-governmental organization that helps survivors of institutional child abuse. I, I gave you a phone number through my producer offline for you to call. Okay. And uh, what this organization does is it helps you to explore legal options. For example, one option they suggest, they just suggest this to me uh, right now, is if you can try to adopt the child. Do you think that's possible? Um, well, I'm submitting information to DCF, and I'm asking to, you know, at least try to get temporary custody, but I, I'm not getting anywhere. I, I'm just, I'm not getting anywhere. I've consulted with attorneys, and, and they all, you know, they all, no one would, is really 
they really don't see a way in. I'm hoping this organization can help you. If okay. not, there are the other organizations I mentioned, CAFETY.org, or even the Surviving Straight People. They're very nice. They're very strong. They're very supportive. And if there's a way to be found legally, they will. One of the things people are telling me is that contacting the police doesn't always work. They don't exactly. always believe you. Uh, and and so uh, there, are, there are crisis lines. Uh, but I, I am definitely I am a lawyer, but I'm definitely not an expert in this. But these people are. And so I want to it's, and it's not just for you, Annie, but for anyone who knows someone who's suffering through these programs, contact these organizations. Their safety in numbers. As I said, the best way would be to get Congressman Miller's bill passed, H.R. 911. But exactly. in the mean, but in the meantime, uh, you can all work out legal strategies. And I wish you the best of luck with your family member. Keep up the fight. I'm going to keep up the fight. You keep up the fight. Don't ever give up on a child because exactly. we've got to get these, these kids to safety. And yes, thank you do. so much for calling in. I All really right. Thank appreciate you, Mark. It. Next up is a very special guest. Her name is Maya Solovitz, and she has written a book. The name of the book uh, is called Born for Love, uh, uh, Why Empathy is Essential and Endangered. And the other book that's uh, probably more famous in this regard is called, quote, Help at Any Cost. How the Troubled Teen Industry Cons Parents and Hurts Kids. Maya, thank you so much for coming here on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, I got to tell you, you know, you've been working in this. Obviously, your book is, uh, is five years old now. Uh, to so many Americans, this, this, is, this is news. I mean, 60 Minutes hasn't done anything on this. Dateline 2020. Uh, you know, I, me, uh, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, a small town a radio host. <laughs> I, I'm the one exposing this. Why hasn't this gotten more media coverage? Well, to be fair, um, some of the news magazines, 2020 and 48 Hours, have done shows. But okay. when they cover this issue, what happens is it becomes an issue of this is a problem at one particular place. There is, a one, there is one treatment center that is a bad apple. Um, I believe 2020 did an expose of WASP. Um, 48 Hours may have also done that. Um, that's the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs and Schools. Um, it ran a place in Jamaica called Tranquility Bay. Um, it has a place called Cross Creek Banner. Um, uh, probably at least as many of their programs have been shut as are open now. Um, they keep changing the names of them and changing their own name. Um, but what happens is this is looked at as an individual problem, like there's one bad institution. What the media really hasn't recognized is that this is a problem of abuse that poses as treatment. Exactly. That the treatment in these facilities is the abuse, and that what they call therapy is actually, in many cases, torture. Exactly. In fact, by the way, there's a new, there's another organization that's been mentioned. Uh, it's called uh, Survivors of International Abuse, SIA-NOW.org. All these organizations are around and able to help people. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you've written about, Maya, you have an article in 2007 that's gotten almost no notice, but it should get noticed soon because it has to do with Mitt Romney, who is running for president, and the fact that guess who is his national finance co-chair? Good old Mel Sembler. He won't go away. Yeah, no, well, I mean, you know, he's been extraordinarily successful at raising money for Republicans, and in fact, it was Mel Sembler that told Nancy Reagan that drugs would be a good cause for her to take on, and one of the odd ironies of this whole business is that he took her to see a session at Straight Incorporated to see, you know, so that she could hear how bad the problem with drugs was. What she didn't know was that the people at Straight Inc., in order to get out of Straight Inc., had to come up with very dramatic stories of horrific things that they did while they were using in order to show that they were getting better. So they had marijuana smokers or kids who'd never even done any drugs talking about how they had prostituted themselves or had sex with mm. dogs in order to um, get drugs. Um, and Nancy comes out of there saying, we're in danger of losing a whole generation. And she had no idea that these confessions had been coerced with hours and hours of confrontation and humiliation on these poor kids. The irony is that we hear about this kind of thing going on in dictatorships all the time. We hear, I mean, George Orwell very ably wrote, uh, you know, I love Big Brother, right? I mean, this, this whole idea that you could be forced to, to say these horrible things. A and yet this is going on right here in America, right under our own noses. And Maya, a lot of these people um, who have called in, 
terrific, wonderful people, but they suffered in straight 20, 30 years ago. Tell me about what's going on today. Well, there's still a number of these facilities. Um, you know, it has only been in the age of the Internet that people have really begun to make progress in shutting them down. And until last year or the year before, there were still some straight facilities that were open. They weren't called straight, but the Pathway, Pathway Family Center was still open. Um, there was a program in Florida called Growing Together. Um, in Canada, there still is a program called AARC that it was based directly on kids um, of New Jersey, which was based on straight. Um, so, you know, it's only been very recently that the straight descendant facilities have actually shut down. Um, there are still programs that are run by Aspen Education. There are still programs that are run by WASP. Um, there are a number of people who are former employees of places like Mount Bachelor Academy, which I um, exposed on uh, Time Magazine's website um, as the lap dance school, where they literally were forcing girls to perform lap dances as supposed parts of therapy. Um, you know, the, that place was open until last year or the year before. Now, let me um, ask you, Maya, so just, just to give an example. So, so there's this awful place. They're making young girls do lap dancing as part of therapy. You expose them in Time magazine. They get shut down. How are they punished? Is, is anyone ever indicted for, for abuse? Well, this is, this, is the, this is the sort of core of how they get away with this stuff. If you're a parent and you made your child do a lap dance, you would uh, probably get sent to jail as a sex offender. Of course you would. If, yeah. If you're an institution, however, you're so saintly for dealing with these horrible, bad, lying, manipulative, evil, druggy kids that, you know, oh, we'll just slap you on the wrist and tell you don't do it again. Has um, anyone been punished at all in all this history? We have a long history. Straight Inc. has a long history. Thousands of people are being abused. Obviously, Mel and Betty Sembler haven't been punished. Has anyone been punished? Well, insurance companies have had to pay out when kids die. Um, not always. They don't always have to pay out when kids die. That's but, um, it? A few civil suits when kids actually die? That's it? Well, and yeah, I mean, well, actually, to be fair, um, uh, Phil Elberg in New Jersey won um, uh, probably $10 million in total for clients who had been severely abused in kids. How about but criminal there, prosecution? Is there been a single criminal prosecution? I believe one guy, there had, I mean, there was a prosecution, this was tragic, um, in the death of Aaron Bacon. Um, he was starved to death. Um, and allowed to die of an easily treatable ulcer. Um, and he died in a very gruesome fashion over the course of 40 days in a wilderness program. Um, anyway, um, they, prosecuted the, they prosecuted the people who perpetrated this, and they got sentenced to six months, and I think they probably served one month for actually killing somebody by torture. Now, um, I find that amazing because I know if I were on a jury, I'd want the death penalty for people like that. How, how well, you know, the, what they do is they become the only employer in these teeny towns, and they give people who have no jobs and nothing to do jobs. Um, and, you know, this is your neighbor who, you know, um, and these are bad, bad kids. They take drugs. These kids are evil and they lie. And, you know, literally on the stand in, in the Aaron Bacon trial, these people were saying that they still believed the kid was faking even after he was dead and buried. Um, I mean, it's, it's sort of extraordinary, the power of the ideology of these places and the power that we have allowed the word drug to give to people to demonize anybody who takes drugs. It's funny. I've, you know, it's funny. I've never felt that way about drugs. I'm, I'm this weird person in that I've never, uh, and, and uh, pe people who know me know I'm telling the truth. I've never taken uh, marijuana in my life. I've never taken a legal drug in my life. And yet I would fully legalize marijuana because I know that it's, it's, it's really not that dangerous. Uh, but, but it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good thing, uh, but it's, 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 you know, neither are cigarettes. But at the same time, I don't well, think of people as bad people. Of, times of course more they dangerous. are. Of course cigarettes they are. Cigarettes kill 50% of people. They kill 400,000 people a year. Absolutely. And I say that all the time. But mine's, I guess mine's a larger point. When I'm someone is addicted to drugs, 
uh, even very serious drugs like crack or, or LSD, whatever, I feel sorry for them, but I don't hate them. I don't think they're terrible people. I just uh, think they have a problem and they need they need healing. I, I, I don't – where did this drug people are evil, drug users are evil? Is that is that just part of our culture that I, I'm not um, following? It, it's it's deeply, deeply, unfortunately, associated with race because the stereotype of the crack user and the junkie is very, very, very close to the stereotype of the N word. Um, and well, now tell me this: is, it, is there a racial element to this? Are are blacks treated worse in these programs than whites? Well, this is a kind of unique thing. In these teen programs, because they're private and because parents tend to spend a lot of money and mortgage their houses. Black people have been remarkably spared from this one. Now, so this is mostly the, white, white middle-class teenagers that suffer. Yes, yes. And, and that has actually been, I believe, one of the reasons that there has been so little advocacy around this, because people don't believe that middle-class kids need advocacy, and typically white middle-class kids do not need advocacy. But these um, kids certainly do. Hey, Maya, hang on with me. I want you to stay on. I've got to take a break, but I promise I'll be back with you. 888-653-7543. We'll be back after this. The show, my guest right now is Maya Solovitz. She is the author of a book about, well, what we've been talking about for the last three hours and what we're going to talk about tomorrow, by the way, for three hours because there's so many people whose voices need to be heard on this. It's about what she calls, what many have called, the troubled teen industry. She's the author of Help at Any Cost, How the Troubled Teen Industry Cons Parents and Hurts Kids. And Maya, before the break, uh, we were talking about the fact that this still exists today. This is not just an old story. There are still organizations today. Can you give us some names? I mean, name names, name organizations. Let me know who is doing this, where is it going on, and how we could stop it. Well, I mean, the the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs um, has um, some programs that are still open. And unfortunately, my memory is going at this point, so I can't remember which ones are open and which ones are closed. I'll tell you what, you can post um, it on my website later on at marklevine.tv. WWASP, which um, now where where is WWASP? Is that well, uh, they are based they are based in Utah. Um, okay. They're based in southern Utah, and Cross Creek Manor, I believe, is still open. Provo Canyon School is still open. The Elan School actually recently closed, which was astonishing because that place was truly horrific and, and lasted for at least three decades. Um, there, um, Let me there ask you this. Are... You mentioned a bunch of schools in Utah. I began this program reading from um, a, the story, uh, the, uh, the witness of a guy named Alexei. I'm sorry, Alexei. I wasn't sure whether you were male or female, and I, I, called, I called him a woman, and it's Alexei is a male. I want to correct that right now. But Alexei was telling the story that, these, that the particular program he was in was um, heavily run by uh, an affiliate of the Mormon Church, and that uh, one of the ways that he got out of level one of the worst treatment was he claimed to have converted to Mormonism, and then suddenly he got all the best treatment. Are, are a number of these either religious-based organizations, and if so, is it, is, is it the Mormon Church? Who, who else is doing this? Well, there, there's a lot of um, fundamentalist um, programs um, that are Christian, Mormon. Um, uh, you know, there may be um, others of other religions that I am not familiar with, but um, uh, there, there was uh, recently a program, um, I think Anderson Cooper did something on Hepzibah House, um, there are programs throughout the South um, that are Christian, so-called Christian programs um, that, you know, believe in this sort of spare the rod kind of philosophy. And there's a whole chain of them um, that were based on this, this guy's program. Uh, his, na- his last name was Roloff, and I'm spacing his first name at the moment, but um, the uh, Lester, perhaps. Anyway, there was a father and a son, and they um, they ran a whole chain of them. And the thing that is great about the internet is that you know in the past these programs would open up in you know a small town somewhere where they could become the main employer. And, and no one would know, have heard of them. But but people go to the internet now. I'm sorry to rush you. We're just running out of time, Maya. Where do you think is the best resource if people want more information about either you or about the troubled teen industry to get good information? Where should they go? 
Um, well, the um, CAFETY or SAFETY, um, C-A-F-E-T-Y dot org um, okay. is very good. Um, my website, helpatanycost.com, is useful. Um, I write for Time Magazine's website, uh, time.com. And I do. I still continue to cover this issue. Um, Thank you so much, Maya. I'm sorry we're running out of time, and there's still a bunch of people who want to tell their stories. I'll get to those stories when we come back. Welcome back to the show. This is Mark Levine. So many people, so many stories. In fact, I've got five people on hold right now. I'm going to get to every one of you. I'm going to try to at least. If not, if I don't get to you, I do apologize. There's so many people with stories. Don't worry. We are devoting another three hours tomorrow night. This story is so big. There's so many people that want to testify about what happened to them that tomorrow night, Friday 7 to 10, three more hours about what is going on around the country, how American children are being tortured. You heard me. Tortured. This doesn't just happen in foreign countries. When it happens in foreign countries, I get upset. When 3,600 people are murdered in Syria, I get upset. When, when Libyan uh, dictator Gaddafi threatens to, to go into people's closets and kill them, I get upset. But when it happens right here to American children, I'm more than upset. I'm horrified. I'm disgusted. I want to do something about it. And I want to encourage you. I know that my regular listeners uh, may be wondering, they may be, not be able to call in because so many people who are survivors of these programs are calling in. Here's what you can do. You can go and support a bill sponsored by Congressman Miller of California, George Miller. Uh, and I've got the name. It, it used to be called H.R. 911. Um, in fact, I, I know it has a different name now. I was told it, uh, and now I've uh, forgotten it. Something about uh, the teen bill. Someone will tell me, <laughs> because people have been telling me all along in, uh, in, a, in a chat room. Oh, here it is. The Stop Child Abuse in Residential Programs for Teens Act of 2009. Actually, it's 2011. I've got to tell you, it's, it's going to have a new name. It'll probably be 2011. The Stop Child Abuse in Residential Programs for Teens Act. Just ask for Congressman George Miller of California. This is the bill that it's actually a fairly modest bill. It simply would have federal regulation so that you don't have these programs where kids are tortured and not allowed to talk to their parents and not allowed to escape and treated like prisoners when they haven't committed a crime. All right, enough of me talking. I got a lot of people that want to get their words in. Let's go right to Chris in Cincinnati, who's been holding on a very long time. Thank you, Chris, for calling in. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you for calling in. Tell me about your experience. What happened to you? Well, I was in straight, and I was in, um, in the mid-'80s uh, for about 15 and a half months, and I was one of those kids that never did drugs, um, so I was subjected to treatment for a problem I didn't have. Um, the only thing I can say I was honestly doing before straight, I was a rebellious teenager, had some issues with my step family not getting along, that kind of thing. But um, one of the more the thing that scared me to death about straight was the confrontation. Um, I think Meyer or others have called it attack therapy. It's the same thing. It's basically kids yelling, screaming, uh, cursing, spitting. It's very, very aggressive. And um, I was a very shy person before straight, so this was extremely traumatic. And apparently I dissociated. I don't know how I did this, but it, that was apparently my coping me mechanism. You just turned off, basically. Just just basically yeah, pretend I, like it I wasn't happening. It, I checked out. Right. It's like I wasn't there anymore. Um, right. Some, I somehow got through this program and... Some, at some point, fully believed I had a drug problem. I wouldn't have really? graduated. They convinced you you had a drug problem. <laughs> I had a drug problem without trying drugs. It's you know, amazingly enough, and that's the power of mind control. And it it really is very. It's hard to explain how it works, but it's that that strong. It can do that to you. Um, but anyway, I I got out of there and I was um, into my aftercare and I was kidnapped. I was 18 years old, and the reason I was kidnapped, and it, of course, taken back to straight, and that was because mm. they wanted, um, they caught me holding hands with a boy. And now, wait a minute. You're 18 years old. You're an adult. Right. How does straight kidnap you and take you back? I don't, I don't get, how do they do that? How do they do that legally? 
I, that, well, that's an interesting point because the police did find out about this, and they came and got me out straight, and they wanted to use my case to shut down Cincinnati straight because, obviously, it was a felony. Yes, um, felony kidnapping. Do it. Yeah, Is it involved, too late? It was a conspiracy. Did you not want to, at that time, you wanted to just avoid them, I guess? Did you not press I charges? I was so traumatized and so hysterical oh. when I was in that police station. The only thing I could think of was getting as far away as I could. I was so afraid of reliving it over and over, so I didn't sure. press it. And this was, what, 15, 20 years ago, I guess? Uh, 1986. 86. So it's so statute of limitations, a kidnapping is probably run by now. Right, yeah. And and one of the things, this kidnappings are still used. I think they call them escorts now in the, the current. But, but let your lesson be, be a lesson for everyone listening. If you're over 18 and they do this to you, press charges. Let's get some yes. of these people in jail, folks. Send, Chris, i got to move on, even though you've been okay. hung a long time, because i got four other callers I want to try to get their can stories I, can in. Can I mention one Real other quick. thing really Yeah, quick? go ahead. Um, the issue of post-traumatic stress disorder has yeah. um, become very – I was diagnosed in 2005 with PTSD. Right. Um, it's very, very prevalent among straight survivors and of other programs and current programs. It's not something that's just pertaining to us, but there are kids now coming out of these places with PTSD, and we want long-term studies done to research this and get these practices of coercive thought reform bans, the things that are Absolutely. PTSD, obviously, PTSD. that's what used to be called shell shock. It's what people suffer in war times, that they, right. the, the experience is so violent, so horrible, and you suffered it from, from uh, straight. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, Chris. I really do appreciate it. Uh, again, I want to give out a web, another website. I think I said it, restoringdignity.org. Uh, this is a group that also helps people uh, who have been in, in, uh, suffering from this horrible torture let's go to cindy in clayton california cindy welcome to the show hi uh thank you for having me thank you for calling uh, i uh wanted to talk about an organization um wasp uh i was in their tranquility bay uh facility in jamaica as well yes, as Maya was just talking home. about that yes how did you get down there in jamaica what happened to you well um i was 14 years old at the time and um, my father had custody of me, but I was living with my mother, and I went to go uh, visit my father, and he sent me out of uh, the country without her, her knowing. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And I was there for two years. Um, you know, it, it was very similar to what, uh, you know, has already been mentioned. And um, Of course, you're in a foreign country, I, though. They can do almost anything to you. I mean, you, I mean, you have no recourse. You're, 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 you're an American in Jamaica. That must have been really scary. Correct. Like, you know, they, I, I think uh, they go to places out of the country specifically for that reason, um, you know. Reminds me of Jim Jones in Georgetown uh, in Guyana. I mean, they, they, so, so this camp in, in Jamaica... Uh, mm -hmm. th they did the same mistreatments we've talked about, right? Uh, the torture, the brainwashing, the, the yelling in your face, that kind of stuff? Correct. And um, wh what, what I'd kind of like to discuss is kind of the long-term effects on them. Yeah, please um, go ahead. You know, I, uh, I'm writing a, a book currently called Trapped in Paradise, and uh, you can find that on Facebook. And through writing the book, I have gone through... You know, the letters that I've received and the letters that I wrote and just my general feelings about about the whole situation. I've gone through my journal entries, and it's been very uh, kind of a stressful uh, event of doing that. And, and, and looking back, um, you know, I, I don't have as much stress in people. Um, somebody was talking about post-traumatic stress. I still get night terrors from time to time, and this is, you know, 12, 14 years later. Um, you know, I'm sensitive to criticism. You know, there's still a divide in my family about sending me there, even though I uh, have told my father that, that it was abusive. You know, they just feel I should forgive them, even though they don't feel that it's abusive. Cindy, and, uh, uh, here's, here's, and, and I, I think uh, all these resources that I've been naming on the air may be able to help you much better than I. I am no expert in this. Right. I, but <laughs> I would think that if you could show your parents, have them listen to this show, have them yeah. hear the stories of people, and not just you, right? I mean, you, their daughter, but have them hear the stories that uh, uh, Kelly, whose brother committed suicide, and, and, and everyone who called in, and, and just hear what's going on. Maybe it would open up their eyes to recognize that, that they, they were trying to help, but instead they put you in a torture chamber. 
I think um, part part of the reason um, my father won't admit to it is that he does feel guilty about that. I'm sure he does. Uh, I don't think he's able to come to terms with that exactly. Uh, well, you know, it, it was a horrible, horrible mistake, but, but you can't forgive him until he admits what he's done and yeah. recognizes it was a problem. And you can forgive his innocence. I mean, you could say, I wish, you know, I, I, I'd understand that you didn't know what was going on, or you can right. forgive his ignorance. Uh, maybe he right. should have known. But, but you, you could have said, look, look, I mean, you understand why he did it, but he has right. to recognize what he did because otherwise you can't move on. I think you can have, again, I'm no psychologist. This is just off the top of my head. But I think you can have sort of a deal with your father. You'll forgive him. <laughs> You'll understand his ignorance if he will open his eyes and, and learn about these programs and work to stop them. And then I think uh, you can forgive him. Point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've tried to make some bridges with him. And, you know, I, I haven't really talked to him in two years. Uh, yeah. so. that's, a, that's a shame. It just destroys yeah. families. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you well, know, Cindy, I, I think, know this. Mo- most people are good. Most people yeah. want to help. There are a lot of there are evil people in this world. I, that's just true. It's just a fact. But but I got to tell you, just looking at the support from all these straight survivors who coming together, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I hope I I think you have sought them out. Keep seeking them out because there's strength in those numbers of people helping other people. They're good people there, and I hope you'll seek them out. And and maybe they have some better solutions than I've had. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, there are power in numbers, and that's part of the reason why I started writing. I, I want to share our story. Absolutely. And, uh, Keep doing I, that, I, and call those people making that movie, too. Uh, maybe they've got something, uh, you know, I don't know. Hey, thanks for calling in. I'm sorry to, to rush you. i got three more callers I want to get before the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Cindy. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, I'm, I'm not even giving the phone number because there's no more room for you to call in, but we will be hosting this show tomorrow, 7 to 10 p.m., three more hours if you didn't get a chance to call in tonight. We'll be right back with Donna, Nicole, and Rich right after this. Welcome back to the show. We've only got a few minutes left, and I'm trying to get to everybody. I want to get to Donna, Nicole, and Rich. Uh, i got to say, a lot of people are posting some really good resources on my website. If you have a problem, if your child is stuck in one of these facilities, if you know a child stuck in one of these facilities, if you are a child stuck in one of these facilities, or you just have been, uh, you've just escaped, you've just gotten out, go to the resources, go to my website, marklevineradio.com. There's a lot posted there. There's a lot of people there to help you. Let's go right to the lines. Donna in New York, thank you for calling in. Tell me what happened to you. Um. Actually, Mark, I was not a victim of one of these programs. My okay. daughter was. Oh, um, my God. I was at Wits End um, trying to get help for my daughter um, as I came from a long history of drug abuse and addiction, and my teenage daughter had um, tried alcohol and in seventh grade got suspended from school, and I reached out because my husband's military and he was deployed. Uh, basically, I was a single parent for three years because he did three tours back-to-back in Iraq. And I sought out one of these loving, caring Christian homes and was totally deceived and lied to, mm. like many of the other people were stating on the show. Um, they... I thought it was more of a reputable place because they said that they weren't accredited, but they were registered with the state of Missouri. And after the fact, I found out that they have never been. Mm. And, um, what happened to your daughter, Donna? Horre- if you don't mind my asking. Um, she, um, to this day, she's, it's been four years now, and she was only in the program for three months because once I found out the truth about what was going on, I yanked her um, from the program right away. She also was not educated. She was um, forced to do push-up and horse feces. Oh, my um, God. Um, I, I sent. I had emailed you pictures. She had actually had no bed. It was like plywood, really 
nasty uniforms. Um, they were um, sexually exploited at this program, and this yeah. guy is getting away with things. Well, Donna, tell me this. Was, How are they getting away with it? Your daughter is out now. Can you go to the authorities? Um, I have, and I've gone to the Attorney General in Missouri, Even the, and I have evidence in black and white, plus photographic evidence. I've talked to George Cook, to uh, the Government Accountability Office, who did an investigation probe finding many of these uh, allegations to be true from all these programs, and no one is doing anything. In fact, it, it's just so disgusting that... Um, the, the owner of this particular program where I sent my daughter is in with the Sheriff's Department, and since I've been doing all this advocacy and getting the story out there, many people have come forward confirming many of the things my daughter has said about the sexual abuse, the emotional abuse, the brainwashing, the physical abuse. One girl claimed the sheriff had come there and she had bruises, and he just walked away and... Um, some girls have been forced to eat their own vomit. I mean, just horrendous, horrendous things going on. First of all, Donna, let, let me tell you that, that I really appreciate your calling in as a parent. So many uh, of these uh, people who've called in wondered where their parents were, and you discovered what was happening to your daughter. You did the right thing. You got out of the program, and you're fighting. I, I would like to uh, s suggest that you call. You not only contact these organizations I've mentioned on the air, but also talk to George Miller's office, see what they can do at oh, the I federal have, level. I have talked to his office. Have they um, been helpful? Um, I've actually made several trips to Washington, D.C., and my problem is I can't get in to talk to some of these senators in Missouri and stuff because I'm not a constituent because I move all around because of being a military spouse. And, um, you know, no one is really helping do much because, oh, well, um, the attorney general's office actually said, oh, well, we haven't had many complaints against them, but yet they did defraud me out of thousands and thousands of dollars. Which, let, me, let, let, me, let me tell you something, you know, Donna. Um, the way these things work, obviously, there's not just the state government, the attorney general. There are also local authorities. If you can find a single sympathetic DA in your local town in Missouri, um, you know, do, go to that. I don't know. Has George Miller's office, have they been helpful to you? Um, they actually were pretty helpful. Um, They're in, nice people there. Supportive. Um, yes, I, they, they are wonderful. I, I got to tell you, I'm sorry. I wanted to get to a couple other people Keep up the good fight. Listen tomorrow. We're going to give more resources, and feel free to email me off the air. You can also post those pictures, if you're willing to, on my website so others can see them. I, join these these all these other people. The more you work together, all of you, and have a strong voice together, the more we can close these, these facilities down. Thank you very much for calling. I really do appreciate it. Well, well, thank you for all you're doing. You, you are a hero to many of us, you know, because not just – the, the child that's placed there, the, the victim, the, the families are victims, too, because absolutely. it affects everybody. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Thank you for calling in. Uh, I'm going to go quickly to Nicole in Woodland Hills, California. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for taking my call. Tell, are, were you a victim of Strait? Or yes, I was, in, I was in Strait in Yorba Linda uh, in 1990, and um, however... I was able to get out and within four days because what had happened was that um, well, I was 17 years old and I was, in, I was under the care of a therapist, a psychologist, who was trying to work with, I had no substance abuse problem, I never, um, I never even smoked marijuana, maybe had a few um, wine coolers, I mean I was a pretty good kid, got good grades, A's and B's. Um, so, but my mother was tricked, my father was deceased and um, coerced, and um, I begged and pleaded to, for them to call my, my therapist that we had been working with, and they said, no, 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 you're in our care now. So after uh, two days, I was, you know, strip searched, mm -hmm. and um, they knew that I never had a drug problem, but they still accepted me under um, a behavior problem. So after two days, I was in a host home, and um, I, in the middle of the night, I wanted to get my therapist help. I wanted to get, I knew I need, I had a sick feeling in my stomach that this was a cult and this was wrong and I had right. no business being there. And I, I jumped through a window. 
I wow. jumped through a window. I got nine stitches in my arm. Um, I had a head injury. I could barely walk. Um, I hid for a while. I ran to a gas station and tried to call my um, my psychologist. And the minute that um, what happened was the minute that I was trying to get through to him, they caught me and they sent me back to the program. I was bleeding. I had a head injury. They wouldn't let me sleep. They kept me in the bathroom and screamed at me, saying I was a druggy whore and all this terrible stuff. Finally, um, it was a couple days later, I was losing consciousness. I passed out. And they took me, to, they eventually took me to the emergency room. And I begged, because I was passed out, I begged a nurse. I said, please, please, please call my therapist. And she did. She and that's how you were did. saved. That's, I'm and he came and he got me, and they put me on a, a psychiatric hold. And thank God they did. Nicole, I'm sorry, that's actually the end of the show. We have no more time. We are going to do this tomorrow, 7 to 10 p.m. Go to the website, marklevine.tv. Share your experiences. If you didn't get a chance to call in tonight, call in tomorrow. We won't let this lie. <laughs> <laughs>